Hello and welcome to the Okemo Valley TV studio. We're joined by a very special guest who's joining us remotely, um, State Representative Charlie Kimball, who uh, represents Windsor District 5, which uh, he's the state rep for uh, Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth in the state legislature. So welcome, Charlie, and thank you for joining us. As I understand, uh, you may be joining us throughout the uh, session and giving us a, a quick recap on, um, on what's going on there in Montpelier or uh, yeah, or or we're everywhere, but wherever everywhere. you are. <laughs> yeah, Patrick. No, thank you very much for the introduction, and um, I look forward to this. A way to just really uh, touch base and give an update as to what happened in the previous week and in the legislature, what's going on with different bills that are of interest, I think, to the communities, and um, I think that'd be helpful as to get a local perspective, and that'd be great. So, thank you for the invitation. I'm I'm happy to do it. Uh, this was this was our first week of the 2022 legislative session, which uh, was a little strange because we spent one day in Montpelier to be able to vote on a bill that enabled us to go home so we could operate remotely because uh, in reaction to the coronavirus, which continues to just spread fast with the Omicron variant. So out of an abundance of caution, the legislature decided to move to meet remotely for the first two weeks of this session after doing remote work the entire session last year. So we hope to go back on the 18th, uh, back to be in Montpelier the 18th of January. And I, I really hope that that happens. And when will that decision be made? Well, it's I think it'll be made on the 14th. Uh, so next Friday. So we'll know whether or not we should be ready to get in our cars and go to Montpelier the following Tuesday. So we meet, we meet Tuesday through Fridays uh, and we have Mondays where we can go back to our regular workplace um, instead of going to the, to the Capitol building. Um, so hopefully we'll get a good decision on Thursday, depending on what the outlook looks like and what the health of the members of the chamber. We have a few that right now have COVID and they're at home isolating. Um, so it's really hard to know exactly what the health picture looks like in, uh, in a, even in a week. So this is now you're going on just about two full years. You're entering a, th um, you know, I know last session you were entirely remote, uh, and then when the pandemic broke uh, two years ago, you, you all immediately went remote uh, as a March. So now you're going two years. How, what is it like legislating remotely on this on this platform? You know, I have to say uh, we figured it out, and we can actually do it pretty well and pretty efficiently. Um, it's not the same because we, lot, we lose a lot of those hallway conversations where you can learn a little bit more about a particular issue that you may not know about in the cafeteria sitting with someone that is a legislator or a lobbyist who you don't know or a member of the public who comes in and uh, you learn a lot just by being around others physically. Whereas over Zoom, you can do it, but it's more difficult. You have to make a that intentional outreach to the person and then it just gets more formal and you don't learn as much uh, that way but uh, we, it we've made it work it, it's really incredible um, how people have learned how to use zoom uh, we have 150 people on when we do uh, the general assembly and then through committees even interviewing uh, uh, folks that are subject matter experts uh, they know how to do it and so we've adapted well um, it's not the best but we've made it work do you, do you look forward to at some point, whether it's two weeks from now or a month from now or whenever during this session, do you look forward to going back in person? Oh, oh absolutely. I mean, I think the Capitol building is probably the best building in Vermont in which to work. Um, it is the, the history, the, the beauty of the building. Um, it's to be around people that are also have the like mind uh, to try to improve the lives of Vermonters. I mean, that's why we're all there. We don't always agree on stuff and it's great to be, get involved in that debate. So I really look forward to being in person. That is, there's no substitute for it. Um, and having a cup of coffee, even if it's bad, uh, means that you get to share that and break bread with other people. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I've been hearing that a lot just you know, on the local level of people uh, feel like they, you know, there's a, been a strong push throughout this to, to wherever possible to still, whether it's in a hybrid format uh, or, or um, you know, full on in person, people do seem to get a lot more out of uh, actually meeting in in person, which brings me to this. I know that town meeting has come up in the legislature this week, acted on um, whether or not to allow towns to uh, 
uh, meet uh, remotely for town meeting uh, and to vote uh, um, by Australian ballot only? We had some emergency orders last year, emergency executive orders from the governor that um, were you know, all around health and safety. If you remember, those weren't lifted until I think uh, June 15th of last year that really controlled as to how people could get together. And so now with the, this increase, uh, oh, and by the way, we passed legislation that enabled towns at that point to uh, meet remotely and vote by Australian ballot, even to move their town meeting back from the, from the required date of meeting that first uh, Tuesday in March. Um, so now uh, we responded to what towns have been asking for. And they said, we want the flexibility of either to move our meeting back till this Omicron variant actually subsides uh, or to be able to, mo uh, to meet by uh, Zoom or by telephone and to vote remotely, uh, enabling people to either do mail-in ballots uh, or to uh, buy Australian ballot by coming into a, a town hall or something on their own and uh, filling out a ballot instead of having to be in person. So uh, today we voted, the House did, we suspended our rules, which basically uh, means that we advanced a bill through all stages of pa passage. Um, the law, the rules are such that for you to take up a bill generally takes about a week uh, for something to get through. But by doing that suspension, we could pass it today. The, the Senate sent it over to us today. We took it up, voted it out. It's on its way to the governor to sign. I have every indication that he's going to sign the bill so towns can take that measure instead of having to meet in person. And that's also for school districts. It's not just for towns. Uh, schools are technically municipalities, um, so they can also do the same thing so they don't have to have an in-person school meeting. Um, so that's that's what we did. And I think the towns will they don't have to, but they have the option to. That's an important distinction. Well, I know in your district, uh, I was at the Plymouth Select Board meeting earlier in the week, and uh, they did decide to do at least part of it in person, either all in person or as a hybrid. Do you know what Woodstock will be doing? I don't. Uh, I'm not sure what Woodstock has decided to do yet. And um, this is also very fresh. I think part of it was they weren't sure if you could do it this way. Um, and uh, I'm trying to remember, I think last year there was, we did not put off the town meeting um, and we had it on the same day, uh, but it was, uh, uh, there was a town information session on Zoom the night before and that kind of stuff. So it's, it is odd. Um, it, there's nothing like being able to get into the town hall. Even in Reading, I really liked the idea of getting a cup of coffee, getting a baked good that someone just made. Um, I usually stand in the back of the room uh, and kibitz with some of the other folks that are there or then wait for my turn to give an address. But uh, nothing beats being able to just be with people. That is awesome. I'm sure there'll be more to come on that um, as we learn what other towns are doing and if they're going to take advantage of, of, uh, of these options. Um, uh, in terms of this past week, what uh, first, you know, the legislature opened on uh, Monday. The governor gave the state of the state, or was it, did you open on Tuesday? Yeah, on Tuesday. Tuesday. Governor gave the state of the yeah. state on Wednesday. Uh, tell me a little bit about this first week um, and, and how it's differed uh, from years past. Yeah, in a typical first week, uh, there's a lot of pomp and circumstance with the opening of the session, the governor coming in, there's, there's, we all meet in the House chamber and there are dignitaries there, he gives the state of the state address. Uh, he gave that address this year virtually, uh, so he was remote, uh, as were all of us. And um, I think a few people were in, in, in house, but um, in that address, uh, he, he touched on a lot of familiar themes, which we know about, uh, and there are some new themes, but the governor's really talking about what does life look like during the pandemic uh, and the stress that it's put on families, on workers, and our, our financial institution, not our financial institutions, but really on, on workers, on families, on childcare centers, on mental health, uh, the gaps that we have in our life. So we touched a lot of, on that. And then talking about some popular themes, we have a declining population. So we've talked about that, uh, making Vermont more affordable, uh, trying to increase the amount of housing for middle income and lower income individuals, looking at increasing weatherization to make people more comfortable in their homes and save on energy expense. 
uh, a big theme that he took up this year was workforce development. And of course, this huge workforce shortage across the state is affecting everyone, every industry, uh, from nursing to uh, child care to uh, hospitality. Everyone is having the shortage of work for workers. So what do you do about it? He laid out a plan for some long-term uh, improvements into our workforce development system and also some themes such as uh, increased relocation incentives for people to work here. I don't agree with everything you said and we'll figure out uh, what that looks like during the legislative session but uh, but he did touch on a lot of those things and we'll see what we're able to do with the money that we have. We still have a significant amount of federal money. We've got over 400 million dollars uh, from um, from ARPA funds that we still have to allocate, and that's the American Rescue Plan Act. So that gives us opportunities to really make investments in our communities, and that's what we're going to be sorting through this year, too. So it's so pretty significant. The next big thing for the governor is the budget address, and that's happening on the 18th of January, and that's where he lays out his financial priorities, uh, and that really just supports his legislative priorities. Um, the other thing that we had the today or this week and an update yesterday is something called the Budget Adjustment Act. And every year, the governor in January presents an adjustment act. So the fiscal year runs through uh, the end of June. And so when we pass the budget almost a year before that, there are a lot of assumptions made. So by the time we go six months through, they say, okay, now we have to move some money around because things didn't turn out like we planned. So there's some significant movement of money. Just a couple of examples for you. Um, the Vermont Housing Investment Program was approved last year for $5 million, and that is to provide grants to people to improve blighted uh, or, um, or unimproved apartments and uh, to make them affordable. So as long as they agree to keep an apartment affordable for five years, they're eligible for a grant for up to $30,000 to improve that apartment or that unit. Um, so that's that increase from five to $20 million is what the governor's proposing. And then we have to decide if we agree with it or not. So that's just one example of what a budget adjustment looks like. For those of you who don't know, Representative Kim, uh, Kimball is a ranking member of the House Committee on Commerce and Economic Development, and you also co-chair the Rural Economic Development Working Group. Um, That's true. So uh, I know these economic, uh, especially rural uh, economic development issues, are, are very near and dear to your heart. So uh, what, what do you feel uh, from wearing um, your respective hats are, are the priorities uh, in terms of uh, the, the budget for um, budget adjustment and for next year's budget? Yeah, um, housing is a big piece of it, uh, it reaching into rural areas. Uh, and there's just fewer housing options. There are a lot of blighted properties that we find in, uh, on the back roads that could really be put to reuse, active reuse for people to occupy. Um, so that money is, uh, could go a long way. You know, we're still not complete in expanding broadband uh, into our rural landscape. So that's important to follow up on that. We've allocated a lot of money there's a lot of money left to allocate towards that to get people to that place where they can have high-speed broadband. Um, so we'll be looking at that in the coming year. Uh, the Rural Economic Development Working Group, we, we are proposing an omnibus bill that groups together about 10 different ideas around industries that are important, such as uh, forestry, and looking at uh, all the obstacles that exist from a permitting uh, standpoint uh, that would enable forestry to, to thrive in our uh, in our economy more easily. Outdoor recreation, uh, looking at easier permitting for outdoor recreation trails uh, to both establish them and to maintain them. That's in that bill. Uh, looking at making it easier for communities to put in wastewater systems. So if you have a town that has a dense population but no wastewater facilities uh, to process that, then you can have some real issues that come up. It's come up in some towns uh, around us. Uh, and then they just have to adjust. So it's been hard. Um, you know, there's that uh, groundwater contamination in Heartland so many years ago, and uh, there's been, um, you know, Reading has some challenges with their close development. Um, and so it's either wastewater or water systems. And so to be able to either allocate more funds for those or make it easier to put those systems in. Uh, so those are some of the things that are in the rural bill, which is really uh, great. And the in our Commerce Committee, we're going to be focused on workforce and both trying to meet that short 
long-term need of how do you fill the open positions when uh, there don't seem to be any people that are looking for those positions? Uh, or, and then what do you do for long-term? How do you make it so that someone coming out of high school in Vermont can have a rewarding career? And some of it is making sure they're getting in the right path for that career. So we're looking at working together with our, uh, all the stakeholders, which is career and technical education centers, uh, high schools, uh, the state colleges, community college of Vermont, and uh, the employers making sure that what is being taught at those technical skills are what is needed in the employment sector too. So just, there's a lot of work to be done there. Um, Springfield's doing a good job right now of really exploring that with um, some work they're doing, uh, but we need to expand that in other places. So we're gonna be working on that a lot this, um, this coming year and uh, we'll have more to follow up next week. Next week. Um, I, I wanna thank you for your time. Uh, is there anything else from the week you wanna, you wanna add? One thing, it goes off like a, like a sprinter's gun. Um, so that when the gun goes off, you're just running as hard as you can. This week, we had 75 new bills introduced into the House. So that's a lot. I mean, uh, so those are on top of the 480 bills that were already hanging on the wall from last year. We have, uh, you know, those bills are still live. Uh, so that's, it's a lot of things to look at and consider and a lot of different ideas that we have to sort through. And uh, it's going to be a busy 18 weeks. That's how long the legislative session work lasts. Right. And so you're still, are you on a normal schedule where you'll still get the town meeting week uh, break? And, and, and yeah, so aiming oh, yeah. to still finish by mid-May? That's the goal. Yeah. And I think we will because this is an election year and uh, everybody running for office wants extra time to actually get out and campaign. Yeah. And uh, yeah, you and I talked earlier this week in preparation uh, for this and to set it up. And uh, moments after getting off the phone with you, I was listening to VPR and I heard the announcement of, uh, of you're throwing your hat in the ring for lieutenant governor. So uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to uh, talk a minute about that? Sure. sure. Thank you for that. Well, a lieutenant governor is uh, similar to a vice president uh, that really serves in a role to support the vision and shape that. Uh, presides over this uh, the Vermont Senate um, as that officer who's uh, running the meetings and um, uh, and the the role itself as I see it is a way to help shape the policies and programs that affect all of the state and that's what I've been working on as a legislator and I've been lucky enough to do that for the last five years but this is an opportunity to really do it on a bigger stage. Um, Molly Gray decided that she was going to run for the U.S. House, creating the opening. I was like, okay, well, why not me? Um, and so I, I'm going to really try to use the you know, 53 years of experience I have living in Vermont and working in Vermont to try to leverage that knowledge and that experience to you know, help improve the lives of people in, in the state. Mm -hmm. And you, this is your third, third term in uh, uh, as state rep for the district, is that correct? That's right. This is my third term. Um, and so what happens when you run for a different office? Oddly enough, I could run for the same seat and pursue higher office. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I was, that was, okay. Well, I, <laughs> I was leading yeah. you in that direction. My next question was, what are your plans for the, for the district? You, so, so with that in mind, uh, and you, um, with your aim towards the lieutenant governor uh, uh, seat, uh, uh, do you do a, do you have any cultivation process? Do you, do you have uh, with knowing that this that this opening is going to be coming up in the district? I've started to talk to people that have expressed interest in it, um, and the, I think there's some good candidates that are going to come out, and it's a uh, it's a great opportunity to serve the community. So I, I hope that we do have a, a number of people that express interest. And I'm, I'm happy to talk to them about what it really means. You know, how do you hold a job while doing this? Uh, that's not easy. Uh, what does it mean for your home life? Uh, how do you really impact the bigger policies that you're doing? So I've learned a lot over the past five years, more than I thought I needed to know uh, or needed to learn anyway. And um, I'd be happy to talk to anybody that's uh, thinking about it. Uh, I know that they're talking about uh, redistricting potentially coming down the pike. I mean, do, do, you, do you see that in the future for this district? Is there a chance that it'll get shaken up again? I don't think it's going to get shaken up. Um, I haven't seen the final report. So the, it's, the committee that's working on it is going to put forth 
a, a recommendation to uh, and it's for the house it starts in the house and uh, they're going to put forth a recommendation probably in the next couple of weeks uh, based on what the legislative apportionment board did um, and then you, you're really looking at shifting districts based on population changes and the population change for Woodstock, Reading, and Plymouth actually is zero uh, from one from 2010 to 2020. Uh, there have been population changes according to the census in Kellington and Bridgewater uh, and other communities. So there is a, there was a proposal by one particular map to to bring Bridgewater into Woodstock with Reading, and then Plymouth would go to uh, Mount Holly. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, and I think the existing district is going to stay the same. Um, we'll see what the uh, what the vote is. It's going to be a while, probably before. It's not going to be before the uh, mid April. Let's say April fifteenth, when we'll have an idea of what that that looks like. Yeah, that makes it a little challenging, I guess, for any kind of recruiting potential candidates who, like, if they're not a hundred percent sure what they're, you know, what district they're going to be. Uh, it's very true. Yeah. And it's it's frustrating that you can imagine there's angst uh, among some of the representatives about are they going to be redistricted out of a district? Um, yeah. You know, and there's a there was this proposal to make it so it's only a, a one member uh, districts uh, because there are a lot of districts like even looking at uh, Brownsville and Heartland and Windsor. There are two representatives for that particular district. Um, it's not Brownsville, it's West Windsor, you know, uh, but so that's that uh is a two-member district and they the one of the proposals was to carve that up and uh i think the town of west windsor has said we don't want that uh and i don't blame them it's really weird one road was going to be in one district and, uh, and across the street was in another um so th i don't think that'll happen so it, it really is there's a lot of uh, a lot of work that needs to be done on that taking a lot of testimony on it uh, boards of civil authority in different towns have already expressed their opinions on the recommendation by that board. There's this minor, there's a majority report and a minority report. So the minority report is probably going to uh, get some airtime too with those boards of civil authority uh, before the district is solidified. So we'll we'll see. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. 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 Thanks for that uh, the lesson on uh, contemporary fit, uh, civics here in in 2022 in Vermont. We're not. Uh, you know, I, I, you know, it just seems like, I, I don't know how often it gets redistricted, but it seems like it happens at least once a decade where, you know, the districts change slightly and that's due to population change. It's fascinating as to when the census was taken and how people answer the questions. Um, so Killington, I think, gained 1,700 people and Brownsville or West Windsor gained 700 people, something like that. Right. Um, so are those uh, really permanent residents or are they temporary residents? Uh, some people have question whether or not the people who were living there answered the question the right way. If they were a COVID refugee and living there in the uh, for a time, uh, but not a permanent resident. Don't know. It could be right. Those numbers could be right. And what right or wrong, those are the numbers we have to use by law is what the census comes up with. And the results of the census were delayed or else we would have already had this done. Um, so that uh, it was difficult in getting that information um, assimilated. But you're right. It's every 10 years is required by law to figure out if uh, you need to redistrict. There's going to be some movement. There's been some population growth up in Chittenden County, and there's been some population decline well, in most all of the other counties. Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out how that representation works in the state house uh, will be interesting. Gotcha. OK, well, I guess that's it for now for this week. And um, right. we'll talk to you again soon. And I appreciate your time. Um, and thanks for doing this. And, and we hope to bring this to uh, you all um, again and again throughout the session. So thanks. Patrick, thanks very much.